Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, just bad news. Deadlines remain the same as they've been all along. So, quizzes part one, deadline five, May 19th, which is tomorrow, that yeah, end of day, it's long from 9 to 9 p.m. Exam one, quizzes part two, deadline five, May 29th, uh, also end of day. Exam two, quizzes part three, deadline five, June 9th, and exam three, June 17th. And then exam four, quizzes part four, exam five, Deadline 5, June 19th. For the paper, there's an assortment of dates. Uh, if you want to do a draft, then the deadline for that is June 10th. And you can do as many drafts as you want until either you get the grade you want, yay, or you get sick of the process and just say no more paper, or time runs out. Not all the time, but just the draft time. If you want to get the extra credit stuff, the plus five bonus on the paper, be sure to upload it to Blackboard by June 11th, that end of day. If you don't want the five points, but want full credit, be sure it's uploaded by June 15th. If you want uh, half credit, by June 18th. And I'll be turning the grades in on June 19th. So if there's any like issues that have to be resolved, uh, be sure to contact me before then, because once the grades are finalized and in, then changing them becomes problematic. Okay, before heading on to the new stuff, any stuff about the old stuff? or stuff to be, or any stuff that needs more stuff. Okay, so last time we're looking at the exciting adventure that is the paper. If you happen to miss that, um, I'll do a very, very quick recap. Also, there's videos for the paper if you go onto the website, I'm sorry, Blackboard, go into the paper section, there's the PDF guide to the paper, which goes through the paper from beginning to end, step by step. Also, do you describe exactly how I'll grade it, and includes, of course, a complete sample paper. The purpose of the sample paper is basically to show you like what the paper roughly should look like, like in terms of length, you know, the amount of uh, detail you should include, that type of stuff. Okay, so quick, very quick run through the paper we talked about last time. One critical thing is the paper is not about whole apology, it's not about like everything Plato and Socrates did. It's just that particular part where Socrates is accused of being a corrupter of the youth, and he replies back to those that uh, build that charge and modifies the charge with his horse trainer analogy and an intentional argument. Also, um, be sure to label the four sections introduction, summary, argument, conclusion, as I said last time. And then for the introduction, very straightforward. It's really pretty short, it can be done in five sentences or less. Have your thesis, summary statement, position statement, argument statement, a little background. Then also last time went over the summary, worth uh, 45 points. And as we saw, it covers you know, the main charge against him, corrupter. And then he gets latest to modify the charge from corrupter to solo corrupter, and then counters that with the horse trainer analogy. Then he gets Miletus to claim that he, Socrates, is an intentional corrupter, and he counters that with his unintentional argument. And so in the summary, basically a grade depends on how clearly, concisely, accurately you convey those key details. As I mentioned um, last week, the kind of tedious, safe way to do it is just take the outline, which I provided, you know, it's, also, it's in the notes and the paper guide, and just go through tediously to make sure all the points are in there. And that's safe and boring. And I'll get, if you do it, you know, clearly, concisely, accurately in your own words, just tediously doing that, pretty much, not entirely, but pretty much a guaranteed C, because it's totally adequate, totally average. It doesn't get beyond average, it doesn't fall below average. If you want to do about better, that requires not just, you know, just checking off the boxes, but expanding in terms of style, quality, and presentation. And in terms of the grading of this, basically the idea is this. Does it do like the basic adequate stuff? If the answer is yeah, C. Gets the job done, it's average. It's a ham sandwich or you know chicken salad of a paper, or just a salad without meat for those who are vegetarians. To do better involves not so much, it's not really just a question of does it have like all the points in there. To think of, to use a crappy analogy, think of like a meal. Your meal, you can have two meals of the same basic ingredients. The main course, you know, salad, dessert, drink. But of course it makes a meal better or worse than another is not not always does it have like the same number of things in it, 
for the quality of the presentation. So you have two chefs, you know, the same exact ingredients, and one can make something really great, and one can make something, yeah, and another person makes something horrible. Same with the paper. You can have the same exact, you know, points in there, so to speak, but it's how it's put together. So people always ask me, like, well, what is the difference between, like, a C, a B, and A? In a large part, it's the quality stuff. Now, the second part of the second main chunk of the paper is the argument part. And as we saw last time, the objective is to give you a position on the issue. And the issue is, do the arguments work? Actually, there's several other issues. Two of them are, do the arguments work? And then the question is, does the particular argument refute the original charge? Does it refute the modified charge? Now, again, this looks like a lot of stuff, but as I said you know, last week, you can do all this in just two sentences. You could say, it is my view, the horse trainer analogy fails as an analogy. Therefore, it refutes neither the original nor the modified charge. I believe the unintentional argument succeeds as an argument, although it fails to refute the original charge, it does refute the modified charge. Done. And so you'll include basically two sentences. You know, does our train analogy refute? Yes. Or does it have an unintentional, sorry. Does our train analogy succeed as an analogy? Yes or no. Does it refute the original charge that he's a corrupter? Does it refute the modified charge that he's the sole corrupter? Then the second part is, does it succeed as an argument, yes or no? Does it refute the original charge, that he's a corrupter? Does it refute the modified charge, that he is an intentional corrupter? We also looked at, in detail last time, assessing the horse trainer analogy. And the most straightforward way to do that is this. With the argument by analogy, there are three standards. Number of things they have in common, the relevance of the shared qualities, and whether they're relevant to similarities. So what you could do, a very straightforward way to do it is say, I will assess the, the horse trainer analogy by the three standards. The number of properties the horses and the youth have in common, the relevance of the qualities between the horses and the youth, and I'll address whether or not the youth and the horses have relevant dissimilarities. Then you'd say, I'll begin with the number of properties they have in common. And it's either yes they do, no they don't, why or why not. Then you go to the relevance, it's relevant or it's not, why, why not? Then thirdly, you'd say, do they have relevant dissim dissimilarities? Yes, no, why, why not? And in terms of the overall assessment, if the answer to this is not enough properties, not relevant enough, too many relevant dissimilarities, the assessment would be the analogy is weak. It's a bad argument. If your answer, though, is there's enough in common, they're relevant, there are dissimilarities that aren't relevant, that don't break the argument, you'd say it's a strong argument by analogy. And that's how to, how to do it in a very straightforward way. And again, he's comparing the horses and the youth. And again, if you haven't missed class last time, I get a video on Blackboard that walks through all that stuff. Okay, so now we turn to the unintentional argument. Now, before going to that, though, because I want to make sure everyone gets a good chance of getting, you know, an A on the paper, anything about the paper stuff so far that needs any clarification, details, so the paper is not like 100% in terms of, like, knowing what's going on, uh, be sure to ask now. All of this is on Blackboard, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. There's a, um, a video for the paper going through the whole thing. There's also the PDF that goes, goes through all. So you don't have to, like, memorize it. It's, it's there. Essentially, whether you know whether or not it, it um, refutes the church, well, the basically um, three things. One would be you would say, does horse analogy succeed as an analogy? And then you assess it this way. And if you say you know enough properties in common, the properties are relevant, and the dis if there's dissimilarities, they're not enough to break the analogy. You'd say yeah, it's a, it's a, the argument is a good analogy. If you think the answer is you know, no. No, and yes, then you'd say it's a, a bad analogy. Then the second step, once you decide whether it's a good or bad analogy based on your assessment, you decide whether you think it refutes the charge or not. So you're acting kind of like a judge. You're essentially saying to yourself, does this convince me? If I was voting, you know, for Socrates, innocence, or guilt, how would I decide? 
Yeah, the original charge is that he did corrupt the youth. Now, probably the easiest reply here is that the horseshoe analogy as presented explicitly doesn't refute this because he says, you know, if the, art, if the analogy works, it shows that there are many corruptors and not just one. Even though Socrates probably implies he's a horse trainer, he never actually argues that. He doesn't come out and say, hey, I'm Socrates, I'm a horse trainer, um, you know, benefiting them. And so you could say, it doesn't refute the original charge, even if it works. Now, you could take the view that Socrates is implying he's the horse trainer, and then you'd say, well, assuming he is the horse trainer, and you find that convincing, you would say it did refute the original charge, that he didn't corrupt them because he's the sole you know, non-corrupter. The modified charge is he's the sole corrupter. Now, if you think the analogy works, what you'd say is, I've established the analogy is a good analogy. The conclusion of the analogy is that the horses are like the youth. You know, because of the horses are like the youth, the, and we saw that the many corrupt the horses, the few benefit the youth, and so if the analogy holds, the many corrupt or harm the youth. So Socrates can't be the sole corrupter, there's got to be many. So if you believe the argument succeeds as an analogy, the rational conclusion is it does refute the modified charge. Because if it works, there'd be many corruptors. Now if you think the analogy failed, straightforward position here. You would say, given that I've shown the analogy failed, it cannot refute the charge because a failed argument cannot support its conclusion. And that would be the, basically the first half of the argument. Now before moving to the second half of the argument section, the unintentional argument, anything about the horse trainer analogy, the assessment or this stuff that needs any stuff. Okay. Now, the next thing that Socrates does to try to refute the charge against him is that unintentional argument. But doing the argument section, you don't have to like represent the argument because you can assume the reader has read your summary and so they know what the unintentional argument is. Now in assessing the unintentional <laughs> argument, one thing to do is, well, one tedious thing to do would be to assess every single part of it. But for the sake of like, you know, being concise, typically arguments have like key points that you know, think that the whole argument tends to kind of hinge on. Now, with the unintentional argument, a lot of the stuff, you could argue if you wanted to, but a lot of it seems safe to, to accept. Like, for example, that bad people do bad stuff. They really don't have to prove that because it's by definition. It'd be like saying, do runners run? Well, yeah, kind of a definition. Do non-runners not run? Yeah, pretty much by definition. So we could say that, you know, we don't really have to prove that good do good, bad do bad. We can kind of assume that stuff. So the main fight is over the key premise. The, the focus of the battle is this. Socrates has argued that if he corrupts someone he has to live with, it's very likely he'll be harmed. And so the core of his argument is, since he knows that, he would not intentionally corrupt the youth because they would, would, would hurt him. Now his argument, one common mistake people make is they think that Socrates is arguing, hey, if I corrupt the youth, they hurt me. They're not hurting me, so I didn't corrupt them. He doesn't actually argue that. What he argues is, is that if I did corrupt them, they would probably hurt me. I know better to, than to do that, so either I didn't corrupt them at all, or I did so unintentionally. So he's not actually saying that he didn't corrupt them because they didn't hurt him. He's saying that he, he knows that if he did corrupt them, they'd probably hurt him. He doesn't want to be hurt, so either he wouldn't corrupt them at all, or if he did so, he would be unintentional. Now since the key battle is over this premise, you can focus on that to make the you know, paper more concise, more focused. So how to assess this, this particular premise? Well, here are a couple options. One option is to use the argument by example that we saw back in the ancient days of last week. And it's saw an argument by example is when you present, shockingly enough, examples to support a claim. So how could you use this with this particular, you know, assessing this particular premise? If you want to argue in the favor of Socrates, suppose you say you agree with him, you think he's, he's right. What you'd want to find is examples 
which show that Socrates is right. You want to find examples where someone corrupts other people, makes them bad, and they in turn harm that person. Now, one thing that people often do is turn to you know, fiction, movies, TV, etc. And on one hand, I mean, they're fictional, so they're made up, which you know, in a way kind of weakens you. It's like, here's something make-believe to prove something. But of course, they can be a fair example to illustrate them. But you wouldn't want just made-up examples. So, for example, you know, think of like um, a lot of the, the movies, crime movies, or crime TV shows. They have someone who you know, turns people around in the bad, gets them into you know, crime and violence, and then they, you know, they live by the gun, they die by the gun. They're killed by their own, you know, person's killed by his own former friend who betrays him to take over the, the gang. Now, a fictional example like that could be, you know, interesting illustration. But the weak point of fictional examples is, again, they are fiction. But, you know, they do make an interesting sort of appeal to intuition. Now, even better, of course, would be actual historical examples. And thanks to the miracle of, you know, Google, it's kind of easy to find them. You could put in, like, you know, do a Google search on something like betrayals, you know. And, or good places to look would be, obviously, criminal activity, because, as they say, there is no honor among thieves. And you can find real historical examples of people who bring someone up and corrupt, you know, bring them up in, in crime, and then are murdered, betrayed, you know, by their former associates. Politics also features this as well. You know, a common pattern in, you know, corrupt governments is someone gets in power, they have, like, their formerly trusted lieutenant or general, and they get them into the corruption, the general says, hey, or, you know, this is pretty cool. And they, you know, knock the person out of office, kill them, take over. So you can find all kinds of examples in history, crime, politics, etc. Or if you, even outside of violence, think of like in business, you know, peop, you know people bring people in, they have, you know, some kind of shady business, etc. A person's betrayed, etc. and so on. Um, entertainment business, etc. People are always betraying people. And so you can find historical examples of, that support Socrates. So you find as many examples as you can of cases where someone makes someone else corrupt and they are in turn harmed. And then you'd say, given all these examples I've given of people corrupting people and being harmed, it seems reasonably that Socrates is right. Now what if you think Socrates is wrong? Well in that case what you do is you look for examples and you, you could find, you know, again, fictional ones, maybe illustrated a little bit, provide kind of like an interesting example. Or, better yet, the historical examples of cases where people make someone else bad or corrupt them, but those people don't turn against them. That they're able to corrupt and turn their followers or minions against other people, but they never turn on the person who corrupted them. And interestingly, history is full of that as well. For example, we can find examples of criminals who corrupted people, but their people remain loyal to them. You know, to the end. We can find examples of, you know, people who are political leaders who were very corrupt, you know, essentially criminals, but their followers remained loyal to them. They were never, they eventually, like, came to a bad end often, but were never betrayed. And so you can show that people, you know, using historical examples, that people are able to be corruptors, but able to avoid being harmed by their, their followers. And if you think those examples are better, you'd say, given that I've shown these examples in which someone can corrupt people and avoid being harmed by those they corrupt, this shows that Socrates is mistaken. Now, of course, the reason why I picked this is because if you may be wondering, what's the right answer? Well, the reason why I picked this is something you could argue. There's probably a right answer, which is more likely. <laughs> but we can find examples that support both positions. You can argue either side that people can corrupt and avoid being harmed, or that people, when they corrupt, they're probably going to be, be harmed. Now, another way to do it, and you can use both of these methods, you can also use an argument by analogy to assess this. Instead of using like a particular example, where you say, here's examples of like corruption, you know, harm, or corruption, no harm, you can think of analogous situations. For example, we could take the... Uh, well, using the trainer analogy, we could take the dog trainer analogy. 
And one thing you can argue is, by analogy, think of like someone who's training their dog. If someone is corrupting their dog, so to speak, making their dog into a vicious you know, canine killing machine, you could say there's a good chance the dog will turn on them. For example, one of the, well, it was kind of funny, but kind of in a horrible, tragic way. Years ago, I was running in a park, and this was um, quite a while ago, back before dog fighting was like really big in the U.S., but starting to become big. And so people were training their dogs to be, you know, to fight. And there's people training their dogs to fight each other in the park, and this guy's beating his dog, trying to get it to attack the other dog. The dog jumps up and just clamps around on his butt, takes a big chunk out of his rump. I went and I'm like, serves him right. On the other hand, it's, you know, horrible to see that kind of, kind of thing going on. And you could say, by analogy, if someone turns their dog into a vicious, you know, psycho killer, the dog's likely to turn on them. So you, you wouldn't want to make your dog into a vicious canine killing machine because you could be the next, you know, person being killed by that canine killing machine. Now, if you want to do, argue against Socrates, you could talk about people who do train their dogs to be canine killing machines, and the dog kills other dogs, attacks people, but never attacks them. And you can make, you know, an argument by analogy either way. You know, the loyal killer and the psycho dog that, you know, turns on its owner. So, if you agree with Socrates, and you want to use argument by example, find examples which show that he's wrong. And then conclude, given my example, Socrates is correct. His argument, his premise is plausible. Or if you think that he's wrong, find examples that go against him, conclude his premise is mistaken, so the argument would fail. Or if you use an argument by analogy against him, you would say, I've shown by analogy, the key premise is plausible, making the argument, you know, supporting the claim the argument is good. Or if you show, could show the key premise is implausible, you would say that this shows that the argument is defective. Because again, a key part of an argument being good or bad is the quality of the premises. If you can show the premise is plausible, plus in favor of the argument. Show the, the, the premise is bad, it's a minus against it. Now, the final thing to do is also assess sort of the general reasoning of his argument. Because in this case, is basically this. If I corrupt the youth, they'll probably hurt me. I don't want to be hurt, so I'm not going to do that. And so you, you'd assess, is the reasoning good? Does that make sense? If you think yes, you would give a reason as to why that's sensible. If you think no, you'd have to show why the reasoning is bad. So when assessing the unintentional argument, basically the two tasks are one, is this premise plausible or not? If you think, yeah, plus in favor of the argument, think no, minus against it. And then the other assessment is, is his reasoning good? Is that good reason? If you think, yeah, you know, plus in favor, think no, minus. Okay, before pressing on, anything about assessing the unintentional argument that needs any more stuff, intentional or otherwise? Now, once you say whether the unintentional argument is a strong or weak argument, the final thing to do in the argument section is to address the final two points. Does it refute the original charge? Does it refute the modified charge? Now, if you think the argument failed, you have an easy answer. You just say it refutes neither because a failed argument cannot support its conclusion. If you think the argument succeeded, then you'd have to ask, does the argument as presented refute the original charge that he corrupted the youth? And the answer seems to be no. Why? Well, because it leaves open the possibility that he corrupted them unintentionally. And the original charge is just he corrupted them. So if he proves either he didn't corrupt them or he corrupted them unintentionally, he could still be a corrupter. An unintentional one, but still a corrupter. So even if the argument works, it doesn't seem to beat the original charge. Now, the modified charge is that he's an intentional corrupter. Now, the easy way to respond to this is to say, if you believe the argument succeeded, you'd say the conclusion of the unintentional argument is that either he didn't corrupt or he corrupted unintentionally. So, given I've shown the argument succeeds, he has refuted the modified charge. If, however, you conclude that the argument does not succeed, you would say, given the argument has failed, as I've shown in my above assessment, it cannot refute the charge. So Socrates 
did not succeed. So how is the argument section like graded? One question people often ask is, well, is there like secretly a right answer? And the answer is no. I intentionally pick something that can be discussed and debated, so that way there's no, in a way, correct side to pick. So your assessment is not based on, did you guess the right answer, but based on the following stuff. First, did you do all the stuff you're supposed to do? your position, assess each of the arguments, you know, determine whether it refutes the modified charge, the original charge. And then the next step is, of course, the assessment of the quality. How good is your assessment? How well is you, did you write it? How clear, developed, etc. it is? So there's a question of, did you do all the stuff that's supposed to be in there? You know, are all the ingredients in the sandwich, so to speak? Then the second thing is, how good are the are ingredients and how well is it put together? So again, to use my crappy analogy, it's much like assessing food. You know, if you're making a, like a, a you know sub with certain foods in it, there's a question of does it have all the stuff that's in the order? Do you have like the meat, the cheese, you know, the vegetables? Is that in there? And the second thing is, is it good quality? You know, is the cheese like moldy or good cheese? And then of course is how well it's put together. Is it just like you know a sub roll thrown in a bag with some meat thrown in there and some cheese and some lettuce and just a big mess, or is it put together well? And so essentially that's how it's assessed. Is all the stuff in there? Is it good quality stuff? And is it put together well? Okay, before finishing up talking about the paper, anything about the stuff so far that needs any more stuff? Now the conclusion, here's the easy way to do the conclusion. Copy your introduction, then go to the end of the paper, type, you know, for conclusion, and then paste your introduction in there, and make two changes. Change one, go from the future tense, you know, I will argue my position, you know, what the current tense my position is, to the past tense. You know, you'd say that the purpose of this paper was, blah, 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 in my summary, I summarize my position was, I argue that. And the second change is, instead of having the minimal background, you'll have some final relevant remark. Could be anything. Could be something like, and thus we see that although Socrates is dead, his legend as a philosopher lives on. Or whatever. And again, the way this is graded is, I just go through and see, are there five points in there? If it's five or five, five points. If less than five, less than five. And it should be 125 words or less. You could actually do it in, well, if you had a really long run on sentence, you could do it in one sentence. Okay, so that's the writing of the conclusion. Before heading back to the apology, finishing that up, anything about the paper at all that needs any, any stuff. So perfect crystal, crystal clarity on the paper. Okay, so now we hop back into the um, main text of the Apology, right after the unintentional argument. Now again, for the paper, you just have to do the stuff we went over. So one common mistake I see often on the paper is people just do like the whole Apology. Or they try to do like all of Plato for some reason. And all you have to do is focus on that, that one narrow part. Now hopping back in the Apology itself, in addition to the charge of corruption, Socrates is also given uh, charged with these religious crimes. Now, he walks Miletus through, again, some questions. And initially, it's claimed that Socrates is teaching about new divinities. And kind of the theme that Socrates does is, you know, this sort of the original charge against him. And he asks Miletus a series of questions and gets Miletus to refine the charge. And then he uses that basically to try to refute charge against him. So he asked Miletus, what is the actual charge against him? He had to clarify it. Does he 
believe in some gods and is not an atheist. Because an atheist in the broadest sense is you know, atheism, believing in no gods at all, as opposed to being a theist, which means a person believes in one or more divine entities. And of course there's monotheism, believing in one god, polytheism, believing in bunches, or at least two or more. And then there's of course pantheism, believing everything is God. A view held by our good dead friend uh, Spinoza. The second option is, is it that Socrates, you know, believes in gods that are not gods the city recognizes? Now, Miletus claims Socrates is an atheist and a teacher of atheism, but he also claims that Socrates believes in, you know, spirits and demigods, etc. So kind of the setup he gets leads to agree to two things. One, Socrates is an atheist, and he gets Miletus to accept that Socrates believes in like demigods, heroes, and spirits, etc. And he's basically setting up Miletus for well, you know, defeat. So how does he make this happen? Well, he claims Miletus engaged, engages in a contradiction. How so? Well, he makes use of another analogy working like this. Miletus has basically said Socrates is an atheist, but he also claims that he believes in these, you know, demigods, heroes, and spirits. And he says, you know, he's accusing him of these two things. So the analogy he draws are these. Firstly, could a person say believe in human things, you know, made by humans, and believe that there never were humans? And be and not be crazy. Or do you use it, I mean, to use it, for example, suppose, could someone believe there are things made in America, but claim there is no America? No. No. I mean, I mean if someone could say those words, but you can't believe both. You know, if someone believes something's made in America, they could have believed it was America. Similarly, a person can't believe in horsemanship and not horses. Or to use a modern analogy, you couldn't believe in, like, NASCAR driving and not believe in NASCAR. Similarly, like you couldn't, a person couldn't believe in flute playing, but deny there were flute players. Now, Socrates has been accused of believing in spiritual and divine agencies. But if he believes in those things, he has to believe in spirits and demigods. And if he believes in demigods, he has to believe in gods. Why? Well, in uh, Standard Mythology 101, demigods are the children of gods and mortals. It's, you know, the Greek gods were always doing stuff. So there are a lot of heroes, like, for example, um, Hercules, you know, supposed to be the, the son of, of Zeus. And then you have other, you know, mostly Zeus, he was always doing stuff. Similar, like, uh, if you follow, you know, DC Comics and all, uh, Wonder Woman, supposed to be the, the daughter now, the, the new story is the daughter of, of Zeus, I guess, her, her new origin story for the Batman versus Superman movie, or whatever's going on there. Ben Affleck punching someone, putting someone else dressed as Batman. So he draws the analogy here between you know, someone believe, claiming that they believe in um, mules, but they don't believe in donkeys and horses. But of course they can't, because a mule is just donkey, you know, the parents of a mule is a donkey and, and a horse. So he says Miletus has got to be totally wrong here, because if he believes in these divine beings, he's got to believe in those spirits and demigods. So accusing Miletus of engaging in a physically an absurd riddle. You know, the demigods and spirits are gods, or children of gods, but Miletus claims Socrates doesn't believe in them, but Miletus has to accept that Socrates believes in gods and believes in demigods, because we saw the demigods are the children of gods, so it's got to be gods. Otherwise, by the analogy, it'd be like someone going around, sure, I believe in mules, but I don't believe in horses and donkeys. So, he ends up concluding Miletus is engaged in a, a contradiction. So essentially doing a, in a way a reductio ad absurdum. Miletus has said, has said, you, Socrates, are an atheist, but you believe in spirits and, demo, you know, spirits and divine entities. And Socrates says, well, yeah, that's like saying, you know, I believe in mules, but saying I don't believe in you know, donkeys and horses. If I believe in one, I've got to believe in the, the other. So his conclusion is that the Miletus is wrong and stupid, in a way. 
Now again, this doesn't have to be, this is not, this thing's not on the paper, we're just going off with more of the apology. So it gives a good example of how to, to argue. You know, Socrates is laying out what would be the implication of a particular, you know, claim, because if it's claimed that he is an atheist, and it's claimed he believes in divine beings, both charges can't, can't apply. And so it's a good illustration of that sort of reasoning. <coughs> Before pressing on, anything, anything about uh, his argument, or Greek mythology, or donkeys that needs more stuff. Now, Socrates, as I mentioned, he is you know, not really a spoiler because you know, we know he's dead, but he's found guilty of these charges and he's sentenced to death. Interestingly, during the vote, more people vote to put him to death than, put him, than vote for his, his guilt. Now, Socrates wants to argue, you know, because he sort of brings up the point why he's willing to, to be there and is not just saying you know, anything to get out of, out of trouble. Because one criticism he kind of puts forth is of people who go before the court and will say anything to avoid punishment. Now, Socrates claims that a person shouldn't be afraid of death. Why? Because to be afraid of death is the pretense of wisdom. It's the claim that one knows what one does not know. Namely, that death is bad. Now, Socrates, as we saw, claims that he's obligated to obey the state. This doesn't come up in the Apology you know, directly, except for the fact that he's there. But in the dialogue after this, the Crito, Socrates' friends come to spring him, and they're saying, Socrates, we can bust you out. And Socrates argues that he has to stay, because he has agreed to obey the state. Now, he does say there's one thing he won't obey the state if they order him to do, namely, if he's ordered to stop being a philosopher, or if they offer him, and they say to him, Socrates, you're kind of annoying, but if you just stop doing this philosophy stuff, you know, we'll let you go. Just sign this form, no more philosophy, and everything's okay. Now, Socrates refuses to do that, and his reasoning is this, and it does raise points that are still relevant today. First point is the famous gadfly analogy. Socrates claims that they should not punish him. They certainly shouldn't kill him. In fact, he says they should be grateful for what he's doing, which is kind of an odd thing to say. You know, someone's like really annoying, and someone says, hey, you should be grateful for me annoying you all the time. An obvious question would be, so why is that? Well, here's his analogy. He likes analogies to horses. And so he says in the analogy, the state of the city of Athens is like a horse, a noble steed that's, you know, kind of full of oats and is kind of tired, just wants to kind of take a nap. And he says he's the gadfly to the horse of the state, that when the horse just wants to eat oats and lay around, he sort of bites at the state and makes it alert and keeps it, keeps it going. So he keeps the state from basically slacking. Now, this, of course, is still relevant today, because we still have states, and they still want to do either, you know, not do stuff, or they want to do bad stuff. Now, do people in power like people criticizing them? They, do they, they say, hey, you got another critic. Call me out on, you know, their, their exciting blog. No, people generally in power don't like criticism. But a good question is, should they? Should someone in power value criticism? Well, part of it would depend on the criticism. I mean, no one wants people just, you know, trolling and just saying horrible things. You know, you can think, to use a, you know, a standard example, think about how, like, President Obama feels about Fox News. He probably not, if Fox News, you know, closed, he probably would not be sad. And, I mean, of course, he's not going to close it himself because that would be unconstitutional, but he wouldn't be sad if they went off the air. A lot of people wouldn't, although John Stewart would be kind of sad because that's a lot of that's golden material. Similarly, you know, on the right, they wouldn't be too sad if MSNBC. Do people, do people watch that? I don't know, but it, it wouldn't be sad if it went off went off the air. Now, but 
suppose someone is actually a legitimate critic. They're not just like trolling and flaming and saying hateful, stupid things, but someone actually has legitimate criticism. You know, legitimate points of, you know, here's how things are going bad. Should someone in power or authority, should they value that? That sort of, you know, critique? Well, I guess it depends what they're trying to do. If you're trying to do a good job, is constructive criticism useful? Yeah, I mean, a good analogy, Socrates doesn't bring up the analogy of the coach, but the only way to improve is like a, an athlete or an artist is to have criticism. If someone just says, oh, you're doing great, and you're not doing great at all, you typically won't get better. And people who are in power, you could argue, just like someone who's trying to be coached in sports or learn how to draw or sing, they appreciate good criticism. And so, you know, perhaps Socrates is right. There's also the question about who should be doing that, whose job it is in society to critique, you know, the state, the people in power. Now, one view is, of course, who's supposed to be doing that? They have cameras and stuff. Yeah, journalists. Oh. You know, one kind of traditional role is, you know, when we have, you know, if anybody's in journalism, we have, they, I assume they, they still teach the big examples of like Watergate and sort of the definitive investi investigations. But of course, now it's harder because, you know, uh, budgets for news and investigation takes a lot of work. And interestingly, the way people get to interview or interact with you know, people in power is by their permission. For example, suppose you're a reporter and you want to be at the White House press conference. Do they have to accept you just because you have credentials? No, they decide who's going to go there. And if someone's like pretty obnoxious and asks a lot of tough questions, they might just say, sorry, you know, I guess we seem to have lost your pass, Sally. You're not coming to the next briefing. And so people will push questions, but they generally don't push, you know, super hard, because then they don't get to come back to many cases. Now, in addition, to, of course, to the press, do the citizens have a, a job there to be critical of the state, to say, we don't like what you're, we think you're doing wrong stuff? Yeah, and so it does become an important part of, you know, I guess, civic and social responsibility. And, of course, people you know, who are in power and they're sort of defenders, and people are critical. Even if it's legitimate criticism, they'll often sort of lash out against that and want to silence the, the critics. And Socrates provides a pretty good argument why there should be criticism. Namely that if there's no critics, things just go bad. And he thinks people should be grateful for that criticism. Now, interestingly, other thinkers, like uh, Confucius, for example, had a similar view, that when someone makes a mistake, they should admit their mistake, because the only way to get better and make fewer mistakes is to admit there's a, a mistake being made. And we see it playing out, you know, one issue, is a concrete example from today. Think of um, the question that all Republican candidates are now being asked. Knowing what you know now, would you, if you were president, have invaded Iraq? Which is a question about, you know, the ability to potentially admit mistakes. And it's been kind of a disaster for, for poor Jeb. And of course Hillary gets, has to answer the question too, because she actually did vote for her you know, for the war. So Hillary's got to come out and answer that question. But what she's doing, of course, now is avoiding the press entirely. She just does not answer questions, which is one way to avoid the gadfly. You just do not engage. Now another interesting point, and one, uh, again, relevant today to show how philosophy still relates to now, Suppose you, you want to bring about change. You look at you know, the social, economic, political system we've got, and you have concerns about it. You think maybe it's un unfair or not working properly or has you know, some, some defects. A very practical question is, if you have that belief, how do you go about bringing about change? Now, there are, of course, a variety of options, historically. And one is, well, violence people have used. You don't like it, you just go around blowing stuff up, shooting people, throwing tea in the harbor, that type of stuff. Another option is to try to get into politics yourself. You know, get into the system and try to, to change it, run for office. Another option is to not go into the, you know, politics oneself, but try to change it from, from the outside. Now to show that it's relevant today, use a concrete example. 
We, of course, have the presidential election coming up in, well, more than a year, a year and a few months. And whenever there are people who are kind of popular, people will ask, you know, are you going to run for president? And one good example of this is Elizabeth Warren. She's you know, a senator who well known for <coughs> you know, often advocating for consumer rights, you know, in favor of you know, middle class and uh, people you know lower economic status. And there, just people are discussing today why isn't she, you know she says she's not going to run, and people are wondering well, why isn't she running? And you know her answer was she's not ready for it. You know the presidency is not an entry level job. So a person should have more experience. But then it's also been claimed that she thinks she can actually, if she ran against Hillary, her view, her honest assessment is probably she wouldn't, she can't beat Hillary. And so the question would be, you know, what kind of influence can she have? And what people have, were claiming today is that even though she's a you know, senator, by not running for president, she can push Hillary's position. She can call, have an influence. And so Hillary is being pushed more progressive because of the influence of Elizabeth Warren, to use an example. Similarly, um, the great political philosopher Sarah Palin. She used to be you know, uh, governor of Alaska, and she resigned halfway through her term. And interestingly, one thing I was, when I saw that, I was like, wow, she's doing a Socrates. And she gave the exact, exact thing Socrates said. She, her claim was, as governor, she couldn't get things done. She couldn't influence politics. And that by leaving, she claimed she'd be able to, to change things. And I was like, wow, Sarah, that was very Socratic of you. And that's Socrates' argument, that if someone wants to fight for the right, um, not to party, I guess one to fight for that as well, a person must not get involved in the politics. And his concern, of course, is, you know, also survival. Because, you know, in the U.S., politics is usually not fatal. But, you know, other parts of the world, it, it can be. You know, people who try to bring about change, they vanish into prisons or just simply disappear. So it's still a legitimate concern today. Namely, if you think there's a problem with the political system, what sort of response should you have? Try to change it from in the system, change it from the outside. Is it safer to not get involved in politics? And of course, a lot depends on what kind of country you're, you're dealing with. In the U.S., politics is generally safe. We have, we have assassinations, but they're not, it's not business as usual. They're rare. Other countries, assassination is business as usual. So Socrates finishes this case, and they have a vote, guilty or innocent. And Socrates is found guilty of these charges. So the next step in the, the trial is this. As I mentioned, the, the trial in Athens was like a big super jury trial. They had the, you know, the citizens, the male citizens, they would you know, vote guilt or innocent. The next step is the punishment phase of the trial. And what the person accused would do is basically counter, the offer a counter punishment. So Miletus, he's asked, you know, what punishment shall be inflicted upon Socrates? And he says death. Now, it's believed that Miletus probably didn't want to kill Socrates, didn't want to have him put to death. They're probably hoping that he would choose exile and go away. But what Socrates did, being Socrates, is this. The first thing he does is he says, well, a suitable punishment would be to put it up at the uh, Pritaneum. What is that? Well, it's a place where they put the Olympic athletes. In, in modern terms, it'd be like saying, it'd be like being accused of a terrible crime. They say, well, how should we punish? And you'd say, well, how about you put me up at a five-star hotel <laughs> for life? And people are probably will to know that's not, not really a punishment. Now, his reasoning is, is that Olympic athletes just give people the illusion of happiness. And his claim was he gave people the real deal, the real truth. Then, of course, you know, his friends are like, oh my god, what are you doing, Socrates? You're going to get yourself killed. And they, they say, pay a fine, offer to pay a fine. And he says, very well, you know, he offers like a small sum. And his friends, you know, say, no, no, offer them more. He says, okay, I'll pay, um, I'll pay this fine. And they might even at that point accepted the fine. But Socrates keeps on going. 
And so they have the vote. And what happens? Well, he's sentenced to death. So how does he kind of provoke them and what's his response? Well, here's, here's how it goes. <coughs> One of the key questions in, in life, which hopefully we don't, most of us will never have to face, is when you're in a situation where you can save yourself by compromising your values, should you do so? Now, fortunately, most of us will go through life, well, we'll always, we'll also be given, we'll always place a choice, compromise values to get stuff. But hopefully it won't be compromise or death. Usually it's like compromise or miss out on like a promotion. Or compromise values or miss out on like a couple points on a quiz or something. Small compromises leading to the road to hell, I guess. But he's, you know, he's looking at the big one. You know, suppose you're in a scenario where you have a big, big challenge. Do I give up my values or my life? Which fortunately, again, we generally won't face that. Now, his view is this. He'd rather die than compromise his values and live. So what's his reasoning here? Well, looked at, you know, sort of in the big picture, it does make a, some degree of sense. How so? What he claims is this. The difficulty here is not to avoid death. Why? Because no matter what you do, you're going to die. So that avoiding death is not an option. You know, postponing it for a little while, option. Avoiding entirely, currently, not an option. Maybe someday, but not now. So since there's no way to not die, the question is, what, what is within our power? It's not within our power to currently to like never die. But it is within our power to avoid being unrighteous. So we can't avoid death, but we can avoid being you know, evil, compromising our, our values. And in the case of Socrates, what he thinks is this. Um, in a way, his, his analogy kind of falls apart pretty quickly, but yeah, you know, it sounds kind of cool. He says, you know, he's older and slower, and he's going to be overtaken by the slower pursuer, namely death. His accusers are young and fast, so on unrighteousness, the faster pursuer catches them. And so his view basically is that we're all going to die eventually. So you can't choose, you know, I'll take the option that results in immortality. But it's within your power to, to live well or to live badly. And so there is kind of that big question. And it's a... Again, most of us will never face the challenge of die or live by your values. People do face that. Some people choose to die rather than compromise their values, and some people choose to compromise rather than die. But every day of our lives, we do get to face those small things. Every day, and even in tiny things, our values come up against compromise. In each moment, we get to decide, do I compromise my values or do I stick with them? And there's always a price. And the question is, you know, which do you, which do you pick? And Socrates had the big challenge. He probably could have gotten out of it by talking in their manner, you know, begging forgiveness, you know, giving up philosophy. But he knows he's going to die anyways. So he chose to remain true to his values and die. Now also turns to another interesting, important point. But one thing that's done historically all throughout all countries and all times in the world is when evil people are in power and people criticize them, what happens to the critics is often they are put to death. You can see examples of that in the United States. You know, you, you know, we can go back historically at the Civil Rights Movement. People critical of you know, the Klan, you know, Jim Crow laws, killed, just straight up murdered. Uh, if we go to you know other countries, we can find examples, you know, regular examples as well. People who are critical, like I mean, ISIS just kills everybody, <laughs> for example. And other countries, it's part of government policy. You know, people who are critical, they get killed or, at the very least, just locked away. It's kind of places like China, for example. And people accuse the United States of doing similar things, locking away or silencing critics. And this goes back to the question of. How should we handle criticism? Now, people in power, of course, don't want people challenging them. 
So a natural response is to, to punish those who would be critical of those in power. Now, Socrates says, you know, gives a different bit of advice. Now, he notes that even if they kill people, that can't prevent all criticism. In fact, you know, unless they're able to kill all critics everywhere, it just increases the criticism. Also, as he notes, the easiest way to avoid being criticized by others is not like killing and silencing others, but not being evil. And if someone's not horrible, people aren't going to criticize them for being horrible. And it's an important sort of moral, you know, challenge. You know, how does one deal with, you know, being bad? And one option is, you know, go fully to kill anybody who's critical, just boom, kill them. Better option probably is not be, not be evil. And Socrates believed again that people were evil out of out of ignorance. So he actually just wanted to help people. Now, he notes here the voice. As I mentioned, Socrates is known for having a voice in his head. Now, normally we think of people have their voices in the head that they're telling them to do awful things. We think of people like you know Son of Sam, for example. You know, a voice saying it's time to cleanse the village. Type of deal. But his voice is kind of nice. It'd be like having a voice telling you stuff like, hey, it's, it's time for some ice cream. <laughs> That'd be a cool voice. Or a voice saying, you know, um, be sure to floss, brush your teeth. That wouldn't be a bad voice at all. And here's the voice that's pretty cool. Because apparently what he would do, whenever he was going to like make a mistake, he would say, it almost it was kind of like a, I guess like a collision thing. You know, like they have the car, you know, smart cars and they warn you, like, you know, the lane, something in your lane. He would tell you, like, do this and it's bad. And he claimed his voice would always warn him, telling him when he's going to make a mistake. And that'd be super handy <laughs> when he was right. And he says his voice didn't give him any sign. So he knows that he's doing the right thing. Which I wanted to make him sound a little crazy. My little voice in my head says, this is all cool. Uh, which is probably not a great, great thing to say. But he believed that. And as I mentioned before, there was a New York Times bestseller written about this issue. Socrates, you know, is one of the most famous people to hear, I guess, good voices, but there are other people as well. The author, in fact, was writing, one of the people in her book was apparently like her father, who heard voices. But they told the voices were always like the voice of conscience, telling them, you know, to do good stuff. But it's an interesting question. And apparently hearing voices is pretty common. And in the past, it was seen like not as such a bad thing. And there are probably plenty of people who hear voices today. We just learn not to tell people we hear voices. <laughs> Now, so Socrates is sentenced to death, and his friends are very sad, because they're his friends. And, you know, you know who your friends are, because they're the people who are sad if you're sentenced to death, <laughs> as a rule. Now, to try to sort of help his friends, to ease their pain, he presents a pretty bad argument as to why death is nothing to fear. Now, what he's presenting here is a good example of what's called a false dilemma. In a false dilemma is a fallacy, a mistake, and reasoning, where you present two options as if they're the only two, and the reason why it's a false dilemma is there's actually more than just two. So what the person is doing is saying, here's two choices, this is all there are, but in actuality there could be more. So why does Socrates make such a bad argument? Well, some people have said, you know, even if you're Socrates, it doesn't mean you're perfect. Other people have said he's trying to, you know, his goal here is not so much to argue, but to make his friends feel less bad. It's like, you know, telling someone they're going to be all right, and they're truly not going to be all right. So here's how he argues. He says there's all, when it comes to death, there are two possibilities. Possibility one. Death is a state of nothingness. You cease to be. Now this is actually taken from um, another philosopher. You know, there's a classic argument, you know, that if death is the end of everything, it's nothing to fear because you won't be around to suffer. You have nothing to worry about because you won't be there. It's like, well, that's technically true. It can't, it can't hurt anymore. The second option is it's a migration from this world to another. Now he says, if death is a state of nothingness, it is unspeakable gain. It's like a a night of dreamless sleep that lasts forever. Now, 
But one could, of course, argue that ceasing to be might be something to fear. Because again, if once you're gone, you're gone, you can't suffer. But you, people seem to be reasonably afraid of just ceasing to be. The idea of just you know, gone and nothing. The second option he gives is death is a journey from this world to a better world. Today, we would describe it as a heaven-like place, you know, a good place. And is heaven something to fear? Are people scared of heaven? Yeah, it would be an awesome place. Sounds pretty cool. So he says either way. Either it's, you know, good or super awesome. <laughs> and neither is anything to fear. So death, nothing to fear. Now, is he right? So well, are there other options? That could be true. Well, typically <clears throat> in most religions, if you get a heaven, you also get a, a hell. And is hell bad? Yeah, hell is super bad. Mm -hmm. Think of like the baddest thing you can imagine. Hell's even worse than that. Way worse than that. It's got like, you know, flame and scorpions. It's got TV, but it's stuck on QVC and the twin that the clicker is broken. No, mm -hmm. QVC forever. <laughs> So it's kind of like being stuck in an airport for all, forever and ever with fire and scorpions and all that horrible stuff. Yeah, so if there's like a hell or hell-like place, that'd be pretty awful. And of course, you can imagine things that are less bad than hell that are still pretty bad. For example, like limbo. Just walk around, you know, in a gray fog forever. It'd be really boring, which is also kind of like being stuck in the airport forever. Or there could be reincarnation. You could come back as like a, a squirrel. You know, just as it's going to be run over by a lawnmower, which would be pretty bad. There could be, um, well, another one, there was, a, there was a show long ago called Tales from the Crypt, where they'd have like scary stuff. You probably still see it on the Netflix or, you know, <laughs> get it on BitTorrent, you know, legally and stuff. But one of the, one of the episodes was about, uh, you know, a guy, and it's from his perspective, and he, he dies, and the twist, of course, because Tales from the Crypt is always about the twist. The twist is, is that when you're dead, you can't move anymore, so you're like, you know, like that, but you're still conscious. You can still hear, see, etc. And so it's like, from the standpoint of the corpse, you know, he's like, you know, having his interior monologue, it's like, oh no. And they're like wheeling around, and taking him in the morgue, mor in the last scene, you see the bone saw coming for his face. And he's like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, so that'd be pretty awful. Imagine being trapped in your body when you're dead. You know, you're like stuck in the ground, like, yeah, oh, look, there are the worms, here they come. <laughs> How horrible. And that's pretty, pretty awful. So that could be something definitely to, to fear. So the argument doesn't seem to work terribly well. Because even if we, even if we grant him that nothingness is nothing to fear, there could be other options which could be pretty, pretty bad indeed. Now, he also has faith in the view that no evil can happen to a good person, either in, either in life or after death. Now, one kind of always reply to Socrates would be, but Socrates, dude, man, they're going to kill you. That seems pretty bad. Because people have argued, you know, Thomas Hobbes, uh, later philosopher, said, you know, chief evil is death, what we fear the most. So how can Socrates say that? Because they're clearly going to kill him. Well, his view is kind of this, that they can kill him. True but they cannot make him into a bad person. So surely they can kill him, you know, put him to death, but they cannot, it is not within their power to make him bad. Which I guess is one way of looking at it. But I guess it kind of depends on your view of like, you know, I guess yeah. Now he's aware that his time has come to an end, they're leading him away, but he's confident. His oracle has given him no sign, so he believes that he's doing the right thing. And he asks one final favor of his friends, to trouble his sons as Socrates troubled them, or, and if they you know, care about wealth and power more than virtue, to correct them. And he says, you know, the time our departure has arrived, and we go our ways, him to die, and then to live, which is better, um, God only knows. And then he's let off. But he doesn't actually die at this point. He's, you know, what happens is, is that he sends to death, and the city of Athens is sent on a ship in basically commemoration of the uh, defeat of the Minotaur by Theseus. And he's the hero that you know, went to the maze, the labyrinth of the Minotaur, and 
put an end to the, well, the city of Athens had to pay a tribute to Minos, and they'd send, you know, the youth there to be killed by the Minotaur, you know, bullheaded creature. And Theseus defeated the Minotaur and came back. And according to the you know, Athenian tradition, while that ship is out, there can be no executions in Athens. And the ship is delayed by a storm. So Socrates gets one last dialogue with the Crito, where his friends come to bust him out. He says, nope, can't leave because I agreed to obey the state. And he has to stay and die. In the end, he drinks the hemlock and dies. And that is the end of our good friend Socrates, who died a long time ago and is still dead today. So that brings the end of part one. Before segueing to our adventures in part two, anything about part one that needs more one stuff? Okay. So the quiz is part one. Uh, just general and by tomorrow, cover up through here. And exam one, which deadlineifies May 29th, also covers up to there. And the notes, again, the readings are broken down that way. So like when you're you know, getting ready for test one, the quizzes for part one, uh, the notes, again, are broken down, readings by the sections. So exam one, just part one. Uh, quizzes part one, just part one. And the quiz is also a description about which particular part they're from. So that way you know what you're getting into before you get into it. Okay, anything else about part one before heading to part two? Okay, part two is looking at philosophy and religion. As I mentioned back in the ancient days of last week, as you know, human beings, we've come up with a variety of ways of trying to understand life, the universe, and everything. And three things we come up with are, well, religion, which is basically approaching the world through faith and belief, and looking at things in the context of potential supernatural aspects to reality. We also, of course, have philosophy, which involves dealing with you know, life, the universe, and everything through the use of reason and argumentation. And then we have, you know, the newest of the, of the lot, uh, science, which involves dealing with life, the universe, and everything through the use of reason. And of course, science, one thing that sort of separates it from religion and philosophy is science is supposed to be purely descriptive. This is how reality works. But, you know, philosophy is descriptive in part, saying this is what reality is, and same with religion. It tries to say, here's how the world is. But one thing that separates both religion and philosophy from science is that science is non-prescriptive. It doesn't tell us what is good, what is evil. It doesn't tell us what to do. It just tells us what is. So if we want to know what we should be doing, the guides for that are, two big guides we have are religion, divine guidance, and of course philosophy, which deals with you know, ethics and values. And so we'll look at the two sort of cousins, philosophy and religion. Now, we're looking at it from the standpoint of the West. To see more about uh, religions in other parts of the world, uh, recommend our uh, world religions. Also, I think we still offer, occasionally offer Eastern uh, religions as well. Good stuff. Now, we're focusing on the West because of the influence on Western philosophy. Now, if we go way back to our good dead friends, the Greeks, Greek religion was not a revealed faith. Essentially, as we saw, you know, passed along by the poets, the priests, etc. And of course, they had um, they had polytheism, all kinds of different gods: Zeus, Athena, etc. And interestingly, morally enough, the Greek philosophers, for the most part, either didn't say a lot about religion, or just weren't particularly religious. For example, if you go through Plato, occasionally you hear Socrates saying, by the dog, and what he's referring to is, of course, Anubis, uh, the Egyptian god of the dead, and he occasionally says, by Zeus, but there's not a lot of, in the writings, get a lot of, like, philosophy of religion. I mean, he occasionally references it, but he's not doing, like, theological arguments from authority. And most Greek, Greek thinkers do a similar sort of thing. Like, an Aristotle doesn't really say a lot about the gods. Now, we also, of course, in the development of Christianity, the main factors are, well, the Greeks, of course, and it's also Judaism, 
no, you know, didn't have Judaism, no Christianity. Now, the Jewish tradition, we don't really have a, much of a battle between faith and reason. Why? Well, because the idea is, of course, in uh, you know, Jewish religion, that chosen people of God, and they have a special relation with, with God. I mean, this is not to say that Judaism doesn't involve faith and reason, but we don't really see the, the conflict until we get Christianity. Why? Well, basically this. We have two sources of knowledge proposed. Faith, which is believing not on the basis of reason or evidence, but believing, well, believing. <laughs> and then, of course, there's reason, which is believing on the basis of evidence. And we find in, in Christianity this sort of tension between the two. Belief on faith, belief on reason. And there's all kinds of classical uh, questions in this philosophy of religion. Namely, can faith serve as a legitimate basis for claiming you know something? And one reason to think no is because, well, think of like the ancient Greeks, or the ancient Egyptians, or the ancient Etruscans, or the ancient, you know, um, Norsemen, or the ancient, uh, or the, you know, people, the Aztecs of the Mayans. If faith is a good guide to truth, we have to either assume those people were just faking it, you know, oh, Zeus, you know, or, you know, not really believe what they're saying, or that faith isn't super reliable. So we have to assume either that you know, people who claim to believe in you know, Zeus or Quetzalcoatl or Thor were just faking it. They really didn't have any faith. They were just pretending all along. Or if we accept they really did have faith, we'd have to accept that faith is not a really good guy because they really had faith and they were, as far as I know, totally wrong. Totally mistaken. And so if someone gives basis on faith, they have to say why they, their faith is reliable and why everyone else has been wrong, totally wrong, which is a challenge. Now, there's also a thing about the conflict between faith and reason. When they come into conflict, which wins up? And of course, people give different answers. People who favor faith all obviously say faith. Hey. I mean, we can take, to use a concrete example, think of like the debate we have still going on now. Creationism, or more sophisticated versions, intelligent design, more and more sophisticated teleology, a, pur a purposeful universe, versus a random universe. And basically, purpose versus chance. Happens for a reason, just happens. And that's one of the big conflicts, because according to, you know, what we consider the best science of the day, it's evolution. There is no purpose, there is no God. And then, but of course, people have faith in God and in creation in various forms. And that's still a conflict today. And so the question would be is how do we decide? Now, of course, clever people point out that ultimately you have to have faith. That is to say, unproven belief. Why? Well, as so we'll see when you get to the skeptics, you can always ask, why is that true? So if someone says science, and you say, well, why is that true? Say it works. Why believe that? Uh, <laughs> and eventually you can push someone into the class, classic corner where they have to just say it's just true. You just say, well, that's faith. You're believing without proof. Darn it. Darn philosophers. And so one way to push it is to say, ultimately, we can't give reasons to infinity. We have to have something that we just accept as true. And the challenge is then, how do we, you know, what should we make our article of, of faith? Now, interestingly, going back, you know, in the West, back to Christianity, there are, of course, some important points of disagreement between the Greek philosophers and class of Christianity. Namely, uh, well, Aristotle, Plato, they're at best, you know, pagans. <laughs> you know, talking about Anubis and Zeus and stuff. So they do disagree about, you know, that point. Because Christianity is, of course, Christianity has how many gods? Yeah, one. You have monotheism. And the Greeks had a whole bunch. Also, another point of disagreement, um, Plato didn't seem to believe in, like, gods at all. He talks about the good, as we'll see, you know, in part three. And Aristotle seems to have not believed in personal immortality. So you see, you know, I guess part of the biggest difference is for thinkers like Plato and Aristotle, uh, there's no, there's no real God. And of course, they actually predate, you know, Jesus. So they couldn't be, you know, Christians. 
Although interestingly, if you take a class in medieval philosophy, there are medieval thinkers who claim that Aristotle and Plato were Christians before Christ. Kind of interesting arguments. You take that class, you get to see that, that type of stuff. Now, they do have some points of agreement, though. Namely, you find in Aristotle and Plato a belief in a, a purposeful universe. Again, one of the big questions about life, the universe, and everything is, does stuff just happen, or does stuff happen for a reason? And Aristotle, if you ask you know, Aristotle, Plato, and say, St. Thomas Aquinas, does stuff happen for a reason? They'd all say, yes, it does. Uh, and so they agree on that. Plato also seemed to have believed in a, a soul, in a, what he called, what people now call a Platonic heaven. So you do have points of agreement. If you take a class on modern philosophy or philosophy of religion, you'll see the influence that philosophy had on Christian thought. To understand Christianity, it actually does require understanding Plato and Aristotle. It actually doesn't make sense without that influence. Now, people who are non-believers say that Christianity just basically copies Plato. People who are believers say, well, yes, of course Christianity is like Plato, because Plato's a smart guy, so he got some of it right. So, of course, you'd expect people to have similar views. But it's an interesting um, connection there. Now, the Bible itself, interestingly, does make explicit re uh, references to philosophy. Why? Well, one reason was um, Paul. He was hanging out, you know, in Rome. And during that time, Greek and Roman philosophy was still big. And so you had Christianity basically, you know, starting in a time when philosophy was still a very big thing in Rome and Greek. And so they had to address you know, Greek and Roman thinkers, people who are Stoics, Epicureans. And you see actually references in the Bible about philosophy and about those particular views. And some of it's anti-philosophy, warning of the dangers of philosophy. But others are pro-philosophy, talking about similarities between Christianity and Stoicism, etc. And so, you know, religion, strong sort of connection to philosophy. And in fact, in, the, in Western thought, you really can't understand one without understanding the other. And of course, if you go outside the West, you really can't understand, say, Taoism without understanding Chinese thought. And if you go with, with Islam, you can't understand, actually can't understand the development of Islam without looking at Christianity, Judaism, and Greek and Roman philosophy. So as they say, it's all connected. Now, hoping ahead to the 11th and 12th century, much of what we have today in our world is arises, of course, from the past. It is one thing that any historian will tell you is that you can't understand what's happening today without understanding what happened yesterday or a thousand yesterdays ago. For example, to understand the economic system in the United States, you've got to go back and look at not just like, you know, to 2008, the recession, you've got to go back to the 50s, the 30s, you know, 1800s, 1700s, 1500s, and you got to keep going back for thousands of years. Otherwise, it doesn't, the picture's not there. Now, one view going back to the 11th and 12th century was a view that reason was predominant. I mean, these people still believed in faith, of course, but the idea was, you know, if you had like a little balancing scale, reason was given a lot of weight. And these include some famous dead guys, uh, John Scotus and Regina, Rosellin, and of course the famous Abelard. Then there are folks who believe that faith should be trusted. There was a series of monastic reforms during this time period. Uh, there was Peter Damien, no relation to Damien of the Omen fame, if you've ever seen that classic movie. And of course St. Bernard, not the dog, the, the saint. Now one guy we'll look at is our good dead friend St. Alton. And he had this following interesting view. He believed that all the truths of Christianity were, of course, true. And you could believe them based entirely on faith. But he also believed you could prove every truth of faith through deductive logic and have absolute certainty. And a good question might be, why would you want, you know, both? Why not just, like, believe? But one practical thing would be is you'd want to convince people who are non-believers. You just can't say, if someone doesn't believe, you just can't say faith, because they haven't got that. You need something, something else. 
Now another famous uh, guy we'll look at is our good friend uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And kind of interesting guy. He developed a synthesis of faith and reason. Essentially what he did was pretty clever. He took the works of Aristotle and, to use a crappy analogy, think of like the works of Aristotle as like the first layer of a cake. And then what Aquinas did is basically put a second layer on top of that cake, adding a, a Christian layer on top of it. And so he used a lot of Aristotle's ideas to develop Christian thought. And as I said, one reason why you really can't understand modern religion without going back to the dead Greek guys is because the development of Christianity during this time period by Aquinas is based on Aristotle. So explicitly in Christian doctrine you have Aristotle's stuff. Now, in the remaining time, we'll take a look at kind of the intro stuff. Now, when it comes to God, and God is probably the biggest thing in religion, at least in the West. The big classic question, you know, people think of philosophy, one of the big questions that comes up is, God exists or not? Now, people often, of course, rush to the wrong question, namely this. People will ask, does God exist? Or, you know, what people find out when a philosopher, they're like, so, do you believe in God? And what I always say is, what do you mean by God? I'm like, oh, come on, don't play that game. I'm like, not a game. And they're like, well, why do you, why do you ask if, you know, why, do you, why are you asking me, you know, what do you mean by God? You, you know, the big guy, the guy in the sky. And I say, well, here's the thing. <laughs> Suppose someone asks you, came to you and asked you, is there a glub glub? You would say, yeah, what? <laughs> what is glub glub? Because in order to answer a question, is there a glub glub? you got to know what glove glove is. Mm -hmm. And so if someone asks me, you know, do I believe in God, I ask them, what do they mean? Because people mean very different things. They think they know what they mean, but they usually don't. There's like God. I'm like, well, which God? You know, well, how do you, what do you think of as, is, are you talking about the God of, you know, particular faith? Or are you talking about a particular conception of God? I'm like, no, God. I said, what, what do you mean? And so the first question is a metaphysical one, which is this. What is the nature of God? When someone says, do you believe in God, or does God exist, the first thing to settle is, what are they asking about? I mean, take, for example, the God of philosophy, which is, God is all good, all powerful, all knowing. He's a perfect, infinite being who is perfectly good, perfectly powerful, perfectly knowing. And not everyone believes in that type of God. To give one concrete example, Take, uh, everyone's heard the, you know, the famous, you know, riddle. Can God make a rock he can't lift? Or Stephen Colbert's variation, can God build a yacht that he cannot full of supermodels? You know, the, the question about, you know, can God create a rock he can't lift, you know, is a question about God's power. What is it to be infinitely powerful? Now, one view is, is that being infinitely powerful means that God can do anything, even the impossible. And the answer to the question on that view is yes, he can do that. Does not limit his power? No, because he can create a rock he can't lift, but he can still lift it. You're like, what? Because <laughs> he can do the impossible. He can make triangles, squares, and squares, triangles. He can make 5 plus 2 equal to 8. You can do all the impossible stuff. Now, another view of God is, is that God can do anything that's possible. He can't make a rock he can't lift, because he cannot do the impossible. And so, depending on what type of God you believe in, some people believe in a God that can do anything, even the impossible. Other people say, nope, God can do anything, but not the impossible. And those are two different gods, because one can do anything, even the impossible, and one can't. And some people believe in this God, and some believe in this God, and they're not the same, same thing. So the question to ask is, what do we mean by God? Another example, take God's perfect goodness. Some believe God is perfectly benevolent and good, pure good, no evil at all. Other people believe that God's got some bad, he's kind of a badass. You know, he's not perfectly good. He does, he blows up, you know, destroys cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. He is a vengeful God. All good and all evil come from God. And so a God from which all good and evil come from, and a God that's pure good, they're not the same thing. So if someone asks me, do you believe in God? I say, do you believe in the purely good God, the God that's partially good, partially evil, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the Mormon God, the God of Judaism, the God of the Episcopalians, the God of the Catholics, you know, which one? They're like, no, God. I'm like, no, they're, they're not the same. <laughs> they do different stuff. 
And so question one is, what is the nature of God? And everyone has a different answer. Now, there's a definite answer. There is a definite answer to that. Um, I don't know what it is. I did write a really awesome book and probably put to death pretty quickly. <laughs> but there, actually, no, I would write that book because death would be pretty quick. So I published after I was dead. Second question is, of course, does God exist? So once we decide what God is, what we're asking about, then we can answer that question. Does a, a being that's, that can do the impossible, that is pure good, that knows everything, does that being exist? So that's a of questions. To close, the second set of questions are epistemic, about how we know. How do we know the nature of God? There are people who claim that. I mean, take, for example, the folks in ISIS. They claim that they know God's will, and that God's will is that they kill all of us. The odds are that if you're here, oh, actually, if you're here, ISIS would probably be happy to kill you, unless you're an ISIS agent cleverly here to do ISIS stuff. They'd be happy to kill certainly me, probably everyone here. And they think God totally cool with that. And a good question is, how do they know the nature of God? The people in God hates facts. They totally think God, you know, hates them. And they think they're totally, you know, they're doing what God wants. And so a fair question is, how do they know that? How do they know what's in God's mind? And the second question is, how do we know that God exists? So the metaphysical questions, what is God's nature? Does he, does that being exist? Epistemic questions, how do we know the nature of God? And how do we know God exists? So next time we'll see how we go about answering those questions. But until then, more stuff.